Welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about a structure that we use a lot in quantum mechanics called the commutator. But before I get into the math of it, I really want to spend a couple of minutes and talk about why this commutator, which is a very foreboding name, right, actually has a lot of physical intuition tied up with it. So what we're going to be doing sort of by philosophy <laughs> is we're going to be comparing what two different operators can do to a system. That is, we're inherently going to compare the properties of two different operators and whether or not we can tell anything about the relationship between those operators when we actually take measurements. So let me make that a little bit more specific. I have two operators. I'm going to call one of them operator A. And that operator A has an entire set of measurements associated with it. Um, each of those measurements I'm going to call little a sub i, and therefore each of those measurements corresponds to an eigenvector or an eigenstate that I'm going to call a sub i in the ket, right? So the, the measurement a sub i alone uh, and corresponds to the uh, same eigenstate, which is going to be that same symbol but inside the ket vector. I don't know how many measurements there are. That actually doesn't really matter right now, but I have a certain set of discrete measurements that come out of that operator a. I also have an operator B, and that operator B has the same properties, except all of the A's get replaced with B's. Um, it has a set of measurements. Um, for the time being, we'll say that they're the same number of measurements, uh, and, and we'll come back to that later in the class, but they're the same number of eigenstates for B, and I'm going to call those eigenstates B sub I, and of course they would have corresponding measurement B sub I. And so we do an experiment, and what we find is that when we send some unknown state into A, that the, I get a bunch of beams coming out of that state that correspond to particles that have different measurements. Okay? I'm going to take just one of those beams. I'm going to, I'm, I don't know, I chose the fourth beam for some reason, but uh, state A sub 4 right, comes out of that apparatus, and that's going to be some pure state, and it corresponded to some measurement, A sub 4. But I know that, that because I had a piece of equipment that defined that pure state, I now have something that um, if I were to run it through A again, I would get out just one beam, right? That, that, that A4 is an eigenstate of A, and therefore it's always going to be an eigenstate of A, and if I send it through A, I'm always going to get A4 out, right? That's how we prepare that state. But then something funny happens, because when I take that A4 state, and I run it through the B machine, I only get one beam out of the B machine as well. Okay? And so somehow both A and B can agree that they're not going to do anything to this particular pure state. Now, they might give different measurements, and in fact I did that explicitly here on this slide, right? That beam, when it goes through A, gives me A4, which corresponds to some measurement A4. When I shoot it through B, it gives me B3, which is some measurement B3, right? But neither of these pieces of apparatus destroy the state, or change the state, or destroy information, right? And since we know that if I send A4 back through A, I'm going to get A4 out, and if I send A4 back through B, I'm going to get B3 out, which is also A4, it doesn't matter how many times I send it through A or how many times I send it through B, I'm never going to do anything to that state. I'm just going to keep measuring that state. And at the heart of that is, it doesn't matter which one I did first, right? Because they both agree that this particular state is an eigenstate of both operators, okay? And that's the, that's the philosophical point, right? Or the moral point of, of what we're trying to do today. If I have two operators that can agree on all of the different eigenstates of their system, right? That is, now I take this one example and I extrapolate it to every single one of the eigenstates. If, if, it, if they all agree that those are going to be the eigenstates of the different operators, regardless of what the measurements are, then it doesn't matter which one of those operations I do first. And therefore, those two operations commute. Right? Because if I do A, then B, I get the same thing out that if I did B, then A. And so what we've learned is that, that if I have two operators that share an entire family of eigenstates, that is, they agree on what their pure states are, then it doesn't matter which one I do first, 
they don't so called hate each other. <laughs> that is, they're not going to start destroying information that the other one, uh, you know, they're not going to destroy the pure states of the other operator. And it doesn't matter what the eigenvalues are, right? Because the states themselves haven't changed, haven't been manipulated when I measure one device versus when I use the other device to measure. And that is at the heart of the commutator, right? That if they share this these eigenstates, then they commute with each other. And so it's convenient then to come up with a single operator, not really an operator, I don't know, is it an operator? It is an operator, a single quantity, a single structure, where if I evaluate it, I can tell quickly whether or not two operators commute if I can write down those operators in some representation. Okay, so we use hard brackets to represent the commutator. Um, and I guess, how can you tell that this is different than algebraic hard bracket? Well, there's a comma in it, right? So a comma b, which is an operator, right? Because of how, how it's going to be defined on the right-hand side, is going to be defined to be a b minus b a, right? And of course, if a and b commute with each other, well, then b a is equal to a b, and therefore um, this thing is equal to zero, right? So I'm going to erase those lines because I want to, on this slide, I want the definition of the operator, the commutator in general. But you can see that if it doesn't matter which order I do things, this thing is automatically going to be zero. But if it does matter the order in which I do things, then this operator is not going to be zero, right? And so um, the output of the commutator sometimes will be really important to us, but as at a first glance, the commutator is important because if it's equal to zero, then I know that I have operators that commute. And if it's not equal to zero, then I know I have operators that don't commute. Okay. So we've been working mostly with matrices. And so let's start by doing an example with the matrices that we've, we've really learned to love, right? So I have a spin one half system and I have two two by two matrices that represent Sx and Sy. Now I'm doing this one first because you know from your experience with the Stern gallic experiments, right? that these two operators do not share a common set of eigenstates, right? They are, they, they, we know that if we have, we, we run the output of an X Stern-Gallic experiment into a Y Stern-Gallic experiment, we're going to destroy information, right? Because those two operators do not have the same states, right? They, and it's kind of fun because they do have the same eigenvalues, but they don't have the same eigenvectors. And so now I can do out all of the, I can do out all of the matrix multiplication in both of, and I've just, I've written out SX, SY minus SY, SX. All of these terms have a common H bar squared over four. So I'm just going to pull that out in front. I'm going to have to do a lot of matrix multiplication here, but I get, you know, zero times zero plus I times one is I. In the next one I get, oh, those are zeros. That's kind of nice. And in this last one, I, um, oh, um, uh, I get a m zero and then minus I. All right, that's kind of cool. I'm going to put some curly braces around this because I want to keep that H bar squared over four uh, outside. And now I have uh, minus, I have zero minus I times one uh, is, is going to give me uh, minus I, zero, zero, I times one is I is I. Oh, that's kind of fun. So I have h bar squared over 4. Uh, I have an i in both. I have 1 minus minus 1 is 2. Um, and then minus i minus i is minus 2i. And so I have uh, a, a 1 minus 1. I pulled out the 2, 0, 0. Oh, that's kind of cool. All right, so this is h bar squared over 2 times i times uh, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Okay? This is not 0. These operators do not commute. And therefore, the thing that we knew to be true, which was that, that they, they don't commute with each other, they, they don't share an eigenbasis, um, I guess we figured that out okay, by explicitly doing the matrix multiplication. Interestingly, I did this example because the commutator of Sx and S Sy turn out to be some, you know, they look like they're proportional to some operator that we've seen before. I'm going to leave that for some work that we're going to do in class later. As my second example, I want to do something that's a little bit more abstract, but I'm going to use some pretty simple matrices to do it. 
So I'm going to consider operator A to be an unknown square matrix of some large dimension, but it's going to be a diagonal matrix, right? So what I've done here is I've taken the eigen, I've taken the eigenstates of A and I've written them down in its own basis, right? So that it's a diagonal operator. The operator B is also going to be diagonal, but it's going to be a special kind of diagonal because it's going to be proportional to the identity matrix, okay? And therefore, um, this, this is a, you know, it's some constant, which I'm going to call beta, times the identity matrix. And I'm going to do this as our first example of sort of unknown size matrix multiplication because <laughs> identity matrices are easy to deal with. So if I do the commutator of A with B, I get this A1 dot 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 all the way down times uh, 1, 1 dot 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 all the way down times beta, can't forget that overall factor, minus beta 1 dot 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 times A1, A2 dot 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 dot, right? And now, of course, you say, well, Tom, you chose something really easy because of the identity matrix times any matrix is just going to be that matrix. And so I end up with, um, I end up with beta, that's common to all of the terms, uh, A1 dot 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 minus, oh, A1 dot dot dot, uh, well, that's going to equal zero, right? And so basically any matrix commutes with the identity matrix, but... Um, this is this is uh, this is also really neat, right? Because I've shown that um, I've shown that this 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 thing on the right hand side, right, the uh, the beta, the the B operator and the A operator must also share uh, common eigenstates. Okay, so our take home message is we've introduced this important quantity called the commutator, and we spent most of our discussion today kind of getting some intuition for why the commutator is important and how I can conceptualize the fact that, com that commuting operators uh, must share eigenstates. And when I define it mathematically, that means that I take the commutator of A with B is AB minus BA. And of course the order matters, right? Because uh, with all things that might not commute, I really have to make sure that I get, I get, the, I get the terms in the right order. And that if the commutator of two operators is zero, that is a proof that they share a common set of eigenstates. Okay? See you next time.